And thank you for the honor of giving uh, the invited presidential uh, lecture. And thank you for the opportunity to have the podium to myself uh, for half an hour or so to, um, to give some thoughts, um, some personal thoughts about um, um, where we're headed and what, what we should be doing to create the next generation of a powder belly resurgence. And I'm going to be focusing on the fellowships, which we've been working on a lot. And, uh, and uh, talk about mentorships, because I think we need, uh, and we need to work a little better on that part. The objectives of, uh, I'm an education guy, so you have to have an objectives slide at the beginning, you know. The objectives, there's a lot of <clears throat> different um, uh, perspectives in the audience. There, we have residents, we have uh, fellows and new faculty, and we have attendings. And I think there are different objectives for these different learners in the audience. Uh, for the residents, I hope at the end of all of this, you'll understand the different pathways to HPB training, and the strengths and limitations of each, and how to um, evaluate fellowships and how to play the match and frankly to become a knowledgeable and an empowered seeker of a fellowship. Remember the fellowships are trying to get the good residents so the competition while there may be competition between residents for fellowships there's a competition between the fellowships for the blue ribbon candidates. For fellows and new faculty I want you to come to uh, identify the priorities to success in your first academic posting and the importance of a mentor and how perhaps to identify a right mentor. For the attendings <clears throat> in the audience, um, I hope that at the end of this you'll be able to help better in advising and mentoring your residents and, and um, uh, fellows and junior staff, uh, that you'll come to understand what's expected of your fellowship program and the, and, and the programs that you're advising um, uh, your, your, your trainees to be part of, and to come to uh, recognize the increasing importance of mentorships uh, of new faculty. And during this, I've got um, three proposals, three recommendations I'm going to make to our, uh, our society. I'm going to start by acknowledging the generational differences uh, that we've come to realize, come to recognize. My father was a, a veteran. He was actually on, uh, in the Navy. He was a traditionalist born between 1925 and 1945, called the greatest generation by uh, Tim Brokaw. These um, uh, men and women were influenced by the Great Depression, of course, World War II. There's been a lot written, a lot of analysis have been done comparing the traditionalists with me, the baby boomers, with Gen X, those uh, born between 65 and 80, and new, the new millennials, the nexters, the generation Ys. And while there's all sorts of interesting uh, sociological phenomenon that uh, are being described, and we have to be careful with generalizations, there are some things that I think actually ring true. But if you look some of the, like the characteristics that the, uh, the, the traditionalists uh, are conformers, and apparently I'm optimistic, but it's true that Gen Xs are highly motivated, and my sons, who are in the Generation Y, they have this can-do attitude that's undeniable. Interesting, on this slide, uh, the training. Um, the, the, the traditionalists would say, take your time, don't rush things, we'll get there. Skill and practice has been my mantra um, uh, through my career. The Gen uh, 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 Xs are known for visual stimulation. And look at this, mentorship programs as being important for the millennials. Some other uh, uh, analyses um, uh, from comparing Gen X and Gen Y. Within the mentoring uh, domains, um, apparently, the Generation X uh, individuals are more comfortable in a casual, friendly work environment. Uh, where they're involved, where there's a flexibility and freedom, and this, they, they perceive this as a place to learn. Whereas Gen Ys are a little more focused, they need a little more structure and supportive environment. They have more personalized work. There's a lot of interactive uh, relationships. These individuals are highly networked. And they are being prepared for great demands and high expectations. They know this, and in fact, they espouse this. And when, 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 you, when you debrief them, they, 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 they have these expectations. So the recurring theme of my talk is going to be that in preparing the next generation of, uh, of HPB surgeons, this is going to require adaptation to these distinct differences that have evolved. And as a result, there has been and continues to be an increasing uh, movement towards structure in all aspects of surgical education. Within our fellowships, we've seen it occur over the past decade. The programs and curricula and the evaluations are much more uh, uh, standardized and much more proscribed and certifications now around. Increasing use of, of, of structured mentorships. 
And while some can wonder whether uh, this movement towards increased structure is something that we caused or whether they demand it, the chicken or egg thing, it doesn't matter. It's there, and that's the direction we're headed. So I want to talk about fellowships first. I want to talk about, the, first of all, the reasons for further education following residency. There's both a need and there's a want. The need's pretty clear. Five years is not enough. There's more uh, knowledge and skills to acquire in a shorter work time, a shorter uh, exposure, fewer operations, um, time lost to formal education, research time, so there's less time. But there's also a want. There's a want for subspecialty training. Some people find what we're doing is so cool that they want to do this and they want to train. Or they just recognize that to get a job in the community center, they have to have a niche. So it's, it's, it's a want as well. Just some data, not to belabor the point too much, we do know that with the uh, uh, work duty restrictions, there is clearly a decrease in the amount of uh, uh, operative exposure our residents are getting, uh, uh, are, are receiving. And they're all uh, voting with their feet. This is, I, I sat with a napkin at a, uh, and, and wrote down where the, our graduating residents were, go, uh, uh, were going in 2008 and 2010. And of the 14 graduating residents, 12 of them and 13 of them were going on to further fellowships. And the data, it's about 80% uh, is are, are what is being reported. And uh, this somewhat controversial and, 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 and disturbing uh, um, report from uh, Dr. Minter and her group in the survey of fellowship program directors identifying lack of preparedness of, uh, in their incoming uh, fellows uh, in the operating room, um, uh, inability to independently perform a lab coley, and inability to make progress during half an hour of a major procedure, uh, it raises our concern that these individuals clearly more, need more training. Well, how can you get more training? Well, you can get informal training. You can get ad hoc training from colleagues in a community hospital, and that's a good way to become a community surgeon, at least it has been for many years. Or you can become a clinical associate with a relationship with a, with a hospital that might lead to acute care surgery discipline, but often used to determine whether there's mutual interest, get a little more exposure, get greater responsibility, become a little more independent, and maybe get a job at the hospital. Or you can go to formal training through fellowships. So when you're going to choose a fellowship, how do you choose a good fellowship? How do you find a quality program? Well, let me remind you that the quality of the residency is guaranteed uh, through its accreditation, either through the Royal College in Canada or the ACGME and the ABS uh, here in the United States. And there's heavy requirements on programs uh, and, and, and bars to... Uh, to uh, um, a leap over and developing curricula and education programs and regulated uh, work hours and f f formal um, evaluations. So th the, 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 the quality is pretty much guaranteed out of residency. Also, most of the residencies have a longevity so that they've got a reputation. So that you, 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 the, the history and the institutional affiliation, so there's really few surprises for residents. Well, that's not necessarily the case for fellowships. When I was doing my fellowship in New York, uh, one of my colleagues went and did an HPB fellowship, and he returned two months later because it just didn't work out. We don't want to see that happening anymore, and we recognize that there's a wide range of fellowships in general surgery. Many of them are well-structured and meet uh, uh, all of the um, uh, requirements and attributes of a, a surgical residency program. They're acc accredited. Uh, they got curricula and case volume requirements, and for Lack of another term, I'm going to call these bona fide fellowships. And then there still are a number of uh, scenarios where you can go and attach yourself to a surgeon or two for a year and get good training, perhaps ad hoc training, but perhaps not as structured as it might be, not as rigorous as it might be, and I'm going to call those rogue fellowships. So how do you determine the quality of uh, the fellowship? Um, give me a second. How do you determine the quality of these fellowship programs? Well, you start by overviewing all the, the programs um, in your discipline uh, and see what might be uh, available to you. And I'll remind you that within the, uh, our discipline of general surgery, there's at least 13 different directions you can go, uh, including uh, hepatobiliary surgery, um, um, surgical oncology, and transplantation. There's been a lot of talk uh, at this meeting about the pathways to uh, training in hepatobiliary surgery in North America, and there really are three, through transplantation, through surgical oncology, and through our fellowships, the HPBA and the Fellowship Council. 
Our fellowships, we have uh, 21 uh, 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 programs, HPB uh, fellowships that have been uh, approved and accredited by the HPB and the Fellowship Council. In addition to that, there are five Sir John Can Transplant fellowships that are dual accredited. These are one and two year fellowships that subscribe to the curriculum and standards of the, um, of the Fellowship Council. They have those in common, but their case mix is different. So we have got case volume requirements, and we generate a certificate. And I will remind you that not all fellows graduate. Not all get certificates. And frankly, we have, uh, of the three societies, the most rigorous um, uh, assessment. Uh, the match is with the Fellowship Council, and I know that there are some rogue HPB fellowships presently. The Surgical Oncology, there's uh, 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 13, sorry, 18 programs, in th including the three Canadian programs, offering about 45 positions. These are two-year fellowships, and while they've been accredited by the, surgical, uh, um, um, the Society of Surgical Oncology uh, and the Royal College, they are now um, uh, American Board certified. They're matched through the uh, uh, NRMP, and as I mentioned, there are three of the Surgical Oncology fellowships that um, have HPB track fellows that are dual accredited by the Fellowship Council. And I'm sure you can get surgical oncology training outside of these fellowships. Transplantation, there are 68 uh, programs, including the four Canadian programs with over 80 positions. The world doesn't need 80 new transplant surgeons a year. Uh, there's the two-year fellowships accredited by the Transplant Society, matched by the NRMP. Um, and the programs can be accredited for combinations of liver or pancreas or kidney, small intestine. Fifteen of these programs have also been accredited by the ASTS for either hepatobiliary or hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery. And two of the programs have chosen to go the dual accreditation route with the Fellowship Council, the generator a certificate. I'm not sure there's any real rogue uh, transplant fellowships. We're coming to recognize within our discipline of the HPB uh, fellowships with the uh, AHPBA and the, and the Fellowship Council um, that uh, there is a, a, a growing um, um, individual nature to the different programs. When we first set out to bring all these programs together under the Fellowship uh, Council umbrella, we uh, rejected the notion of training in pancreas only or liver only. We thought you're going to train in core competencies, you have to be competent in all of the uh, H, P, and B, and one size was going to fit all, and that was, that was the mantra at the time. We recognize that the core competencies are now met by uh, all of the programs. Um, and we recognize, though, that there's a different flavor. If some are more liver-oriented, some are more pancreas-oriented. Neither good nor bad, it's just the way it is. Uh, some are much more oncologically-oriented, some are transplant-affiliated. It gives different flavors to the programs. But more importantly, we've come to recognize that there's a variable tr amount of training in some of the newer competencies that are coming in particular laparoscopic or even robotic HPB surgery. Some are very strong, some not very strong at all. Targeted therapies with ablations is, is um, a, a growing um, a, a trend. Uh, vascular resections and reconstructions. Some offering complex upper GI, which could be a very valuable arrow to have in your quiver. Some offering your CP. And my first proposal to our society is that we should now move to an enhanced accreditation system for our HPB specialties, recognizing the importance of core competency training, but also provide additional acknowledgement or accreditation for the uh, additional competencies of laparoscopic training, of targeted therapies, of ERCP or endoscopy, of vascular resections, reconstructions, or complex upper GIs. And so our residents, when they're applying, know what they're applying for or what they're applying to. We'd have to work out some metrics for each of these sub-sub-specialties, but I believe we should be moving in that direction. In that respect, we would be similar to transplant, where you get a, a, a specific training in specific areas. There is a new and evolving trend in fellowship training, and that's dual fellowship training. Lots of fellows are getting dual fellows. Uh, there's individuals in this room who've had both MIS and then come to us for a palatability surgery. Do a couple of years of transplant and then do a palatability surgery. MIS and Sir Jonk. Uh, Sir Jonk and HPB, that would be a good combination. Two years of Sir Jonk and then a year or two of HPB. A lot more dual fellowships occurring and I'm not really sure why that's happening. Perhaps there's just no job so you got to keep training. Um, maybe, maybe you're not independent yet. That maybe during your transplant fellowship you weren't sewing the artery and you're not there yet. Or maybe for the ideal job, you need, you need these uh, uh, additional um, um, arrows in your quiver. 
Well, carrying on with the uh, how you assess a good fellowship program, um, and so this directed to the residents who are looking and to the, uh, to the faculty who are advising, you want to check the program to see if there's a, an academic affiliation. After all, you do have an academic uh, 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 a goal. Uh, do they generate a certificate from the institution, from the university? Is there university oversight of the fellowships? Is there a, a process for grievance and early termination and appeal? What happens if it's not working out? Who can you go to other than the program director? Are there standards for curriculum, pay schedules, vacation, maternity leave? Are they there or is this just a smallish institution that haven't thought these things out? Check out the program director. Um, ask for their CVs. Uh, ask who contributes, who am I going to be learning from? Who's, who's going to contribute to the education? Am I going to be bouncing around from different sites? How much apprenticeship really occurs? And will the program st director still be there in a couple of years? The program director leaves here, it can be high and dry, and that can be a problem. Check out the curriculum, make sure it's adhered to. Uh, Inquire about the formal education program. It can be a real struggle to make those rounds happen every week. Do they use a web-based curriculum? And what will be your responsibilities in teaching the residents and the medical students? Because that's actually a very valuable way to learn. Case mixes are real important in case volumes. You want to know what the institutional strength and request the case logs of the former fellows. Don't take, now uh, on the fellowship council, the numbers are there, but you might want to see a little more granular uh, uh, data uh, about how many Whipples they really did. Check out the former fellows. We, when we, we have people come to Toronto, we give them the list of their former fellows because I believe your alumni are the best evidence of the quality of your fellowship. Check out the working conditions where you have a vac uh, an office, how much vacation you get, is moonlighting allowed, all that. What will be your relationship with the general surgery residents? That's something that needs to be bird dogged every, every, uh, continuously to make sure there's an, uh, a good ongoing working relationship. Are you, are you going to an institution where the residents hate the fellows? Or has it got the longevity that you actually work together and, and, and you're seen as value added? You want to know that. Uh, how are evaluations done? Is it structured? Or, um, uh, is there opportunities for research, particularly in the two-year fellowships? The two, you want to walk away with a few publications with your mentors um, as co-authors. Payment's important. What's the salary? What's the stipend? Is it a, how, what are the tax implications? Uh, are benefits allowed? Are you going to get in a, a, a health care? Um, is there a case-based incentive? Are some of the fellows billing and making more money than you? Because you don't want to live in that environment. You want all the fellows to be totally equal. So be careful about the moonlighting thing. Will you have a conference stipend? Uh, uh, do you have to pay tuition? All those issues you got to look at. And finally, uh, and most importantly, you want to talk to the current fellows. Uh, if you can go out to dinner or lunch with the current fellows to find out what the fellowship's really like. Has there been truth in the advertising uh, that's been uh, dealt you? Does the fellowship deliver the clinical experience in the case mix is advertised? And you want to ask the fellows whether the fellow actually does the complex procedure. That's where you'll find out. You won't find out later when they've graduated because they'll all claim that they were adequately trained. But find out from the fellows whether you actually do the surgery or not. Do you get great, how do you get increasedly um, graded responsibility and how is it graduated during the fellowship? So how do you find a fellowship? Well, there's lots of ways of finding it. Peers, um, your senior residents, um, the local fellows will tell you, uh, tell you what's going on. You almost certainly have some uh, uh, attending staff who are your mentors who can give you a little career counseling. Uh, go to the special societies, come to the AHPBA uh, annual meeting. There's internet sites, uh, you know, the residency forum and studentdoctor.net. And a very effective strategy is to go do an elective rotation or an observership during your early in your PGY4 um, um, year, uh, a week or perhaps a month. It can be a very effective way of getting known and getting a, uh, a good fellowship, if you know what I'm trying to say. Applying to the fellowship, well, this is the nuts and bolts. It varies between our societies uh, for the uh, AHPBA accredited fellowships. It's all done through the Fellowship Council. They've got a really tidy way of applying to our fellowships, and it's all matched with the Fellowship Council. For Sir Jonk and ASTS, you apply directly to the program director and send your stuff there, and you register with a match, and you, you match through the NRMP. And I would suggest to you that it would be, it behoove you to establish and maintain a profile with the prospective program directors. 
Then there's the match game, the different matches, uh, each of the different um, uh, specialties matches at different times, and there is a, there is a dilemma. A couple of years ago, um, the transplanters uh, matched uh, early in the year, opening in January with a rank date in June. And Sir John and HPB, we had a later um, uh, application opening and, our, and our, our match dates were in September. So it wasn't possible to apply to both Sir John and HPB at the same time. That's changed now, so you've got to be aware of that, that in 2015, we've moved our uh, match up to the beginning of the year, and so we now compete with the ASTS, so you can't apply to both of them, and whoever's left over can apply to the Society of Surgical Oncology. <laughs> it's terrible. It's a terrible thing that they have to play. They have to play the, we need a unified match for all post-residency fellowships in North America, like the NRMP match for the, for the, for the residents. However, there's no driver at presence. No, no one, it's not important enough to anyone to do that. Maybe there will be, I'll tell you in a sec. Certification in HPB surgery is certainly currently, uh, you saw the certificates, there they were given out today. That was fantastic, I love it. One of the highlights of the meeting. Um, um, and um, the ASTS gives out similar certificates for their um, uh, graduates and, and uh, the uh, Society of Surgical Oncology, they are now getting ABS um, certificates, diplomas, whatever they're called. What is the value of this certificate? Well, that and the bus ticket will get you on the bus, just don't forget the bus ticket. Um, However, the, the transplanters need certification. They need the STS certificate for UNOS accred credentialing, and we're hopeful that the other certificates become important. But right now, we still uh, rely on, on um, the attestation of competence from the program director, and in fact, hospital privileges, the forms we have to fill out uh, for hospital privileges for new attendings need to be signed off uh, by the program director. So this was really cool. We brought together uh, the three societies and the, um, um, uh, late last year at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the training and HPB surgery consensus conference. The HPBA Society of Surgical Oncology and the transplanters were brought together there. Rohan Jayaraj and his colleagues, particularly Rebecca Minter and all, did a fantastic job of bringing everybody together to deal with the, 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 the competition and uh, uh, that there is um, uh, um, uh, amongst the societies, but also all of the issues that we have in common. And, there's the, and, and, and the results of that um, uh, um, were, um, uh, were presented uh, earlier, uh, earlier today. Um, and I'm going to propose that coming out of that, proposal number two, that we continue to work with these two likewise invested societies to develop oral and practical examinations in hepatobiliary surgery. We clearly need to be moving in this direction. Uh, we need to establish eligibility requirements, um, and then we need to develop and run the exam and certify successful fellows. This, this is the way of the future, and I think there's no denying it. And I think we now have an opportunity. I learned from uh, Dr. Minter of a decision just uh, in January by the American Board of Surgery, and it's the American Board of Medical Specialties, I'm not really sure the difference, but that's an American thing, that they have decided that training in general surgery is going to become four years of residency followed by one to three years of fellowship with an emphasis on transition to independent practice, that ACGME accreditation will not be necessary. In fact, they've got a lot to learn from those of us who, don't, who can work outside of those restrictions and that the fellowship uh, will be, subspecialty, will be included on their certificate. This is a fantastic opportunity we have for ourselves over the next five or ten, who knows how many years. And the implications is it going to bring the rogue fellowships into the accredited orga organizations. It will almost certainly unify our standards. It will allow us to develop uh, um, and, and uh, finalize uh, uh, examinations uh, for board certification, and it's got to lead to a, a unified match. And so in summary about the fellowships, previously there's ad hoc uh, um, um, relationship with a leader in the field and an unstructured and unregulated system in which cream rose to the top. Currently we have evolving um, structured and regulated fellowships and they're getting better all the time. And as I said, in the future I think we're going to see this uh, uh, come together um, uh, in a more unified way. 
Now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and move to the next phase. We're turning out all these great, well-trained young men and women, and now they're becoming our junior faculty, better new faculties, better than junior. Uh, the new faculty, and I'd like to talk a bit about what's expected of new faculty, what they should expect, and I really want to focus on mentorships, and then I'll have a couple of things to say at the end about barriers to success. So back to, back to the differences, the generational differences, it's been suggested that the career goal differences, um, the traditionalists were set on building a legacy, that the boomers want to build a stellar career. That's probably true, you know. Uh, Gen X build a portable career, and I can tell you, my sons who are my daughter in the mid-20s, they're building parallel careers. So there's a lot of truth to these generalizations. So this really hit me when I, when I visited the Mayo Clinic last year, and I got to see uh, Charles Mayo, Charlie Mayo's um, last um, 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 uh, office. And there was his oak desk, and there's his oak um, uh, uh, credenza in the back with all his books. And there on the wall was this, this uh, needlepoint uh, plaque that said, there's no fun like work. Now, I don't think I'm that bad. I don't, I don't really subscribe to that one. But I can tell you the Gen X and Ys sure don't. They, they truly value balance in their lives. They're much better at balance between family and their personal pursuits. And the concept of, uh, of workaholism is perceived as a character flaw. And they're probably right. However, these are still outstanding. Young men and women going to be outstanding surgeons and professional success continues to be a major priority for them. They're just going to get there with a different set of values. So there's a whole bunch of competing priorities for new faculty. There you show up and some of you will sit back and say, yeah, I remember those days. And now they're going to say, yeah, and how do I keep all those balls in the air at the same time? The answer isn't how you keep them all in the air at the same time. The answer is, which one am I going to bend over and pick up next? Because I have dropped that one. So competing priorities after family, and I had to throw that one in. Clinical credibility is by far the most important thing that you need to get to yourself. You have to believe that you can do what you've been taught to do. You don't want to be scared. You want to make the right decisions, and you want to do the right operations. And after about six months, you come to realize that I can do it. And you start to feel comfortable in your own skin. You want to be recognized by the house staff as being the go-to surgeon, because they're the ones who know the good surgeons. That's the reputation you want to have. Yeah, the referring doctors, they'll, you, want, they, you want them to know that you're good. Your new colleagues will presume you're good. The, the nurses in allied health, they'll, they'll, they'll see uh, your, your clinical credibility. But this really is important. We're surgeons first. Number two, academic productivity. Protected time is a figment of the chairman's imagination. Protected time is what you do for yourself to achieve the other things beyond your clinical activities. And it's really important to learn how to do that. And no one really teaches you that. You will have teaching obligations, and perhaps you'll take that as a career path. It can be a good thing to do and profoundly rewarding. Your clinical activity, yeah, you want to get busy. But busy is seldom a problem. It's almost never a problem. In fact, be careful. It's often an excuse. It's usually the excuse for a non-success academically. You may or may not have a, a administrative obligations. If you can avoid them in the first few years, that's probably the best. But you do want to be involved in some of the decision making. You will have all sorts of citizenship obligations. You've got to go to departmental meetings and divisional meetings and program meetings and research meetings and hospital committees. And you've got all these uh, masters to serve and you have to juggle all those balls. And you want to be accepted by the clinical team. You want to be a team player. You want them to, to, to want you there. And, and you do that through all of the above. And the order and the relative proportions of these will all depend on your memorandum of agreement, your job description. The memorandum of the contract. Your development of the contract is really important. And I'm coming to recognize that. And you, you might seek out some new junior faculty to help you develop that. Because you have to be very careful, um, you will be held to this contract. You want to have clarity about what your clinical requirements and limitations are going to be. Can I operate above the cystic duct? 
uh, academic or research requirements, education administration. The devil clearly is in the details, so make sure the details are explicit. In Toronto, we have a three-year review. It's one, two, and three-year reviews. I frankly think that the, the objective of, of, of the of, of, uh, the goal isn't to pass the three-year review. The goal is to become an associate professor or the equivalent. And it may not be everything you want. It's just like buying a house. A one-car one garage will do. It doesn't have to be a two-car garage, but we have to have a family room. There's some things that are deal breakers. It may not be exactly what you want, but you have to be serious. You can't pretend that you're going to do this if you're not going to do this because you will be held uh, uh, accountable. And as you're doing this, I think the overriding thing that you must keep in mind is as you're developing this is who is going to be my mentor or mentors that's going to allow me to achieve what is going to be explicit in the memorandum of agreement. Your clinical mentors and your academic members, you should be thinking that all the time as you're developing that. I've learned a bunch about a mentoring over the past couple of years. I'm sort of getting into the mentoring business. I've learned that mentoring can be considered to be a relationship where an individual, the mentor, takes a special interest in helping another individual, the mentee, develop into a successful professional. That's a reasonable definition. And there are some critical elements that I've learned just recently. That a mentorship is a confidential relationship between two individuals with the objective of proactively assisting the mentee without formal evaluation. This is not your academic supervisor who also sits on your three-year review committee and, and says how or why you did, you know, and, and, and is evaluating. It has to be separate from that. It has to be someone who you can be totally open with and forthright with. And if it isn't that, then it won't be a successful mentorship. It'll be help, but it won't be a true mentorship. And we've come to recognize that there's great importance in mentoring. I am sure that you remember the importance of the mentors through your career. But there's actually some, some literature that uh, mentoring in academic medicine has been reviewed, and in 30 studies, only 20% of which actually had a mentor. Those with mentors had more promotion, higher income, more grants, more publications, and that mentoring had an important influence on their personal de development, career guidance, and all sorts of important things. And on the other hand, lack of a mentor was cited as the number one or number two po most important factor in hindering progress. I just didn't have someone to help me along the way. There's lots of ways of doing mentoring. The classical way in which you identify an individual, perhaps your divisional chief helps you, guides you, you find someone, you get the fit, that's the best. You both agree that this would be a good match. Next best would be a formal where you're, you're told this person's going to be your mentor and you make it work, a bit like an arranged marriage. And both of those are better than no mentor at all. I think the word mentor is, is a little overused, preceptor, shadowing, peer. Peers can be helpful, you know. Um, but I'm going to talk a bit about distance mentoring in a couple of minutes because I think there can be some value there. Multiple mentors, uh, multi-level mentoring, lots of ways of doing it. The University of Toronto, our uh, new chairman, uh, um, uh, developed after um, a serious review um, a um, a strategic plan for 2012 through 2017 and strategic direction number four was uh, to develop a, um, a rigorous mentorship program uh, for new faculty at the University of Toronto with some deliverables. And so our new faculty mentorship program has a mission to provide each new faculty member with an equal opportunity to fulfill their career through appropriate guidance and mentorship. And on the other hand, we want to provide the mentors with resources and training, as well as the recognition and reward for doing this good thing. So how do you be a good mentor? Well, if, indulge me for a second, because there's some motherhood statements here. First of all, a good mentor is an individual who's respected for his or her personal and professional integrity. You gotta have the respect. You have to be committed to the role, you have to be available, you have to be accessible. You have to be able to establish relationships based on mutual res trust and respect. You've got you to respect your mentee. You've got to want them to be successful. You have to be appropriately empathetic. You have to be able to instruct. You have to be versatile because things change, especially during those first three years. The needs change a whole bunch. You have to be particularly effective in interpersonal contexts, model, um, uh, a life of continuous learning, and you've got to be optimistic. 
And it's been suggested that while some of these or most of these um, uh, mentorship qualities are innate, they indeed can be learned. And so in Toronto, we have uh, developed a part of our mentorship uh, program, uh, a divisional lead. Each of the divisions uh, within the Department of General Surgery has a divisional lead. We develop a mentorship committee and structure so we can uh, have uh, 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 similar standards across the different uh, uh, divisions. But we've set up workshops through our Center for Faculty Development. We've had half-day uh, 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 workshops for our mentors and half-day workshops for our mentees and providing them with these tools to make this work. And I'm going to borrow a couple of slides from the mentor workshop and talk uh, just briefly about the key elements of mentoring relationships. And there's a whole set of slides on how to be a good listener, how to do good reflection of practice, how to give feedback. But let me just comment about the most important thing is the balance between support and challenge and the effects that that can have on development. What you want is you want to provide a high, a high degree of support and a sufficient degree of challenge that you cause growth. If you don't do much of either, you'll get stagnation or regression. If you give a lot of support but you don't challenge enough, they'll just keep doing what they're doing. And if you challenge them too much without supporting them, they'll back away. They'll hide and they'll retreat. So that balance between support and challenge is the sort of thing you've got to bird dog and stay on top of. And during mentoring, the good times are easy. Uh, you listen, you reflect, you feedback, give good advice, things are going good, um, you encourage, you try to challenge a little bit, you identify some new ways, give them some challenges. But there will be bumps in the road, and quite frankly, that's why you're their mentor. You have to help them with their first death, their first lawsuit. That can be devastating. Conflicts with other staff or with other things, you have to defend and intervene sometimes with their approval. Uh, health issues, emotional issues, anger management is an issue that I've had to deal with a few times, and, and, and you have to help individuals with this. Marital issues come along. On the other side, we we, at, at, our, at our workshops for our mentees, we make it pretty clear to them that they've got some important responsibilities themselves. It's up to them to identify their goals, of course, communicate their needs and discuss their plans, pose the appropriate questions, and evaluate their outcomes and tell their mentor how they think they're doing and propose new directions. And they're the ones that really have to demonstrate the commitment to the relationship and arrange the regular meetings and keep this thing going. We provide our mentees with this, um, with this um, um, a monograph by Zerzan, which is a really good thing called Making the Most of Your Mentors, a Guide for the Mentees. In choosing a mentor, there's, there, there's, there's no right answer here. Start early in your career, I've already said that. But you have to accept the need and invest considerable time into this. You have to find a, a, the right person who's respected and trusted and who fits with you. The fit has to be there. Um, you have to be comfortable. You have to uh, recognize that the mentors are around enough. Start with inquiries within your own department. Work with your only, own divisional heads. And prepare for the meetings and make the appropriate follow up because after all, you are the driver. So my proposal number three to our society is that I think it's time for us to develop a uh, new faculty mentorship program. Perhaps something like a faculty membership committee, a subcommittee of the Training and Education Committee that will be composed of our mentors to facilitate long-distance mentoring of new faculty within their first three years of appointment, supplement, of course, to their own local mentors, with an objective of academic success, success and in particular, provide them with the ability to network. The program would be something like we would seek new potential mentors, we would actually solicit some of them, uh, Web-based offerings of new faculty of mentorships. The mentees can apply and then meet their new mentors at the mem new members uh, lunch that we hold each year. And then set up semi-structured meetings by a Skype or over the phone or something. With yearly evaluations to make sure it's going uh, well. And with the opportunity for each of the uh, uh, two to continue the mentorship should they wish. With societal recognition to the mentors and mentees and some metrics to evaluate effectiveness. Just briefly then, and perhaps the gray hair, I have the opportunity to, to maybe suggest to you that some of the barriers to success can be uh, uh, avoided, most pitfalls can be avoided. That The cliche of availability, affability, and ability are really important, valuable to your clinical success. 
play to your strengths and develop some personal insight, realize what maybe you're not so good at and stop doing that. I should take my own advice and organize better. You can get a lot done with organization. You can be really much more productive if you're organized. Take the time to sit back, reflect, and imagine. You'll be better for it. Learn how to say no um, um, when it's uh, with the objective of meeting your academic or family commitments. And don't be too grandiose. Young people are too grandiose. And make regular meetings a priority for your mentor, with your mentor a priority. So many of you are familiar with this book, and some of you heard me say this before, but Outliers was written by that Canadian, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, in which, uh, through the use of proof by multiple examples, he analyzed the pathways to success and suggested that the outlier, the extraordinary individual, was smart enough, and apparently an IQ of 120 is the answer, over 140 and you're too smart. You have to do 10,000 hours of, cons of concentrated practice, play the violin a lot. But finally, and probably most importantly, that all outliers owe something to their parentage and patronage and that they are invariably the beneficiaries of hidden advantages and extraordinary opportunities that allow them to uh, succeed in ways that others cannot. And I would suggest to you that your fellowship and your first mentors are in fact those individuals that allow you to become the outlier. Let me close with a picture of myself with my mentors, Bernie Langer, Steve Strasberg, um, uh, Bryce Taylor. And, uh, and all of those that Bernie has mentored. And thank you for the opportunity to have the podium for the past uh, half hour, 45 minutes. And thank you, Elijah, for inviting me to give this address.